This Week at NASA. Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland was honored in her hometown of Baltimore when the Space Telescope Science Institute renamed its Data Archive Center for the longest serving woman in history of the U.S. Congress. It's available to the world for free. And uh, whether you're a, a teacher uh, in South Baltimore or you're a young scientist in South Africa or South Korea, you have a chance to come to the digital library and to have a, a, a library that has more than 100 times information of the, the Library of Congress. The multi-mission archive at STSCI, or MAST, was renamed for Mikulski in honor of her continued support of space science programs. The archive holds a variety of astronomical data sets, primarily in the optical, ultraviolet, and near-infrared, captured by 16 NASA telescopes, including the Hubble Space Telescope, Kepler, and the Galaxy Explorer. Leaders in government, industry, academia, and entrepreneurship recently gathered at the annual Robert H. Goddard Memorial Symposium in Greenbelt, Maryland, to discuss a wide range of topics from the future of commercial spaceflight to protecting our home planet. The theme of this year's two-day event, Dreams and Possibilities, Planning the Achievable, featured presentations and expert panel discussions to devise strategies for human space exploration, technology advancement, and public outreach and education. This was the 50th annual Goddard Memorial Symposium held in honor of Dr. Robert H. Goddard, the father of modern rocketry. Mason Peck, NASA's chief technologist, walked the test section of the Langley Research Center's eight-foot-high temperature tunnel, a facility designed to mimic hypersonic flight conditions. Peck also inspected prototype inflatable lunar habitats that may someday help humans live and work on the moon, and was briefed on NASA's hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. HIAD focuses on the development of inflatable aerial shells to protect a spacecraft during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. HIAD is one of the technologies in development under Peck's office through the Game Changing Development Program located at Langley. America's next heavy lift launch vehicle, the Space Launch System, is a step closer to its first launch in 2017 following completion of its latest milestone reviews at the Marshall Space Flight Center. These extensive NASA-led reviews set requirements that further narrow the scope of the SLS design and concept evaluation, including crew safety and the rocket's interface with the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle. The next step of the review process, scheduled for early summer, will evaluate cost, schedule, and program risks. A rocket sled that replicates the forces a supersonic spacecraft would experience prior to landing was recently tested by NASA at the U.S. Naval Air Weapons Station at China Lake, California. Sleds like this will allow the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator Project, or LDSD, to test inflatable and parachute decelerators for slowing spacecraft as they descend on Mars and other destinations. That would enable NASA to increase the size of payloads it lands and landing accuracy. These new decelerators represent the first steps on the technology pathway to land humans and habitats on new worlds. This test series is led by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. LDSD is one of nine missions managed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center on behalf of the agency. Two IMAX cameras used in orbit have found new space at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. From 1984 to 1998, the two-dimensional IMAX cameras were used on 17 missions by space shuttle crews to capture stunning views of Earth and life in microgravity. It's not just an adventuresome place to live, but actually a pleasant and challenging and interesting place to live. Among those on hand for the presentation in the museum's Moving Beyond Earth gallery were former shuttle commander Bill Reedy, IMAX camera co-inventor Graham Ferguson, and IMAX producer Tony Myers. It's very much like a time machine. Uh, it certainly takes you back to uh, another time, another era. Um, the images, I mean, just seem to be etched 
in my memory, certainly. The footage captured by the on-orbit cameras led to six IMAX films, including Blue Planet, Mission to Mirror, and The Dream is Alive, Inside which had a special screening at the museum's IMAX theater. NASA researchers are one step closer to understanding the thin atmosphere and dust above the surface of the moon. Working as a small observatory, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADI, mission will gather detailed information about conditions near the surface and environmental influences on lunar dust. The LADI propulsion system, built by Space Systems Loral in Palo Alto, California, is a modified version of the kind used in nearly 60 geostationary commercial satellites currently in orbit. Thanks for a great job. Now onward to the, onward to the moon. <laughs> in a brief ceremony, NASA Ames Research Center Director Pete Warden recently took delivery of the propulsion system from Space Systems Loral President John Chelly. Well, one of the really neat things about what NASA is doing is uh, we're trying to do more for less money and uh, a key part of that is, is using commercial uh, practices, commercial parts and commercial partners uh, and so Loral took things they've been building for the commercial community and packaged them a little smaller uh, to take us to the moon and we're really happy about it. We're very proud that, that we had that opportunity. Uh, I think this is a very neat uh, shrunk satellite and uh, we hope that we can certainly do that more in the future. LADI will orbit the moon in a low altitude retrograde equatorial orbit, the most complex lunar flight path attempted since the Apollo missions. A thorough understanding will help researchers predict how future lunar exploration may shape the moon's environment and how the environment may affect future explorers. A new piece of hardware that will provide enhanced satellite observations of precipitation has arrived at the Goddard Space Flight Center. The Dual Frequency Precipitation Radar, or DPR, built by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, will work in conjunction with the GPM Microwave Imager, or GMI. Both are scheduled to fly in 2014 on the Global Precipitation Mission's core observatory. It can be used to make combined products together with the GMI that allow the scientists to determine a lot more about precipitation from rain through snow, be it light or be it heavy, than they know today. Comprised of two radars, the DPR will provide 3D measurements of the shapes, sizes, and other physical characteristics of raindrops and snowflakes. Dr. Krissa Kovaliotu, an astrophysicist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, has been selected as the 2012 recipient of the Danny Heinemann Prize in Astrophysics, jointly selected each year by the American Institute of Physics and the American Astronomical Society. I was floored. I was very excited. I was delighted. I was surprised. The citation for the Heinemann Prize recognizes Kovaliotu for her extensive accomplishments and discoveries in the areas of gamma ray burst and their afterglows, soft gamma ray repeaters and magnetars. This is a mid-career uh, award, so my colleagues acknowledged what I've done and they, at the same time they told me I'll probably have to work another 35 years. <laughs> and then I said, well, that's fine with me, but I'll take in a future X-ray mission with that. The Heinemann Prize is named after the late Danny Heinemann, a Belgian-American engineer, business executive, and philanthropic sponsor of scientific endeavors. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of a Delta II rocket carrying NASA on an odyssey back to Mars. 11 years ago, on April 7, 2001, the Mars Odyssey orbiter began its journey to map and search for water on Mars. Launched by a Delta II rocket from Cape Canaveral, it reached its destination six months later. Not only have Odyssey's science instruments discovered vast amounts of frozen water just beneath the Martian surface, run a radiation safety check for future astronauts, and map surface textures, minerals, and elements, its camera has also produced the highest resolution map of the entire red planet. In addition to its own science, Odyssey has relayed to Earth nearly all of the data provided by the Mars rover's Spirit and Opportunity, and will provide relay service for the Mars Science Laboratory after its rover, Curiosity, lands on Mars this summer. 
And April 8th marks the 10th anniversary of the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-110, an assembly flight to the International Space Station. The launch marked a milestone for mission specialist Jerry Ross as he became the first human to fly in space seven times. The primary objective of the flight for Ross and his crewmates, Commander Michael Bloomfield, Pilot Steve Frick, and Mission Specialists Steve Smith, Ellen Ochoa, Lee Morin, and Rex Walheim, was installation of the S-Zero Truss, the center of the station's supporting backbone. That and other work was accomplished during four spacewalks, including transfer of experiments and supplies between the shuttle and station, and replenishment of an oxygen tank on the Quest airlock, used to repressurize the airlock after spacewalks. The mission ended 10 days later when Atlantis and crew touched down safely at the Kennedy Space Center. And that's this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.